Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We're, uh, we're having to run our sound a little differently tonight uh, because of the way that I'm videoing this with my equipment. And uh, that's just the way that works. Hallelujah. Oh, lights. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. I'm a great believer in light. Part of it comes from being a photographer and videographer. Uh, part of it is that we're just children of light. You know, praise the Lord. Uh, the darkness is not our natural environment. <laughs> Hallelujah. So anyway, um, as I said, Pastor is, is out. He asked me to, uh, to take uh, tonight and to minister the Word. And I've got something that I believe... Uh, the Holy Spirit laid on my heart. It's, it's actually a lot of it is from uh, some teaching I heard recently from Keith Moore. If you have not had an opportunity to hear Keith Moore, by all means, avail yourself of his teaching. Awesome, awesome teaching. Uh, he is, I think, unusual in that though he travels, he's also a pastor, and he has that pastoral anointing as well as a teaching anointing, and that combination just makes for awesome uh, teaching, and of course, uh, same thing with Pastor Ed, praise the Lord, I mean, he, he teaches the Word, he travels, he just has that same kind of anointing, so it, it's fun to see that, you know, that flow, that anointing in operation. Uh, I am a teacher, I am not a pastor, praise the Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> uh, you, you say, Dr. Bill, you're excited about not being a pastor, well... I appreciate the pastor's ministry a lot, and I appreciate the pastoral anointing. I have pastored before, back in 1980, uh, 81 time frame, and uh, hallelujah. It was just a case of where, you know, I said, Lord, here am I, send me, and he took me up on it, and I learned a lot, and found out I wasn't anointed as a pastor, praise the Lord. And that makes it harder. <laughs> it's not easy when you're anointed as a pastor, you know, praise the Lord. But anyway... Uh, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Go ahead and start finding that location. And uh, we'll just open up our teaching tonight in prayer. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to gather around your word. Father God, your word is our absolute authority for our life in terms of our walk, in terms of teaching, in terms of everything that we learn from you must come from your word. And so, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. And, sir, we just believe that he will have free reign, free course here tonight to reveal the word of God to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew 6, verse 24. Now, this is very familiar scripture if you was raised Baptist. <laughs> All right. We heard this scripture a lot uh, growing up. And uh, you don't hear it much around Word of Faith circles. Uh, and I think that's a shame because it's something we need to hear. It's something we need to receive from as believers because this is key to our attitude. And really, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. I'm titling this, Watch Your Attitude. <laughs> and we'll talk more about what I mean by that as we get into this. But uh, it says here in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two Masters. Now, Jesus is speaking here. Okay, this is his authority speaking. No man can serve two masters. Now, if, if that's the case, then let me just put it this way. It must be impossible to serve two masters, right? If Jesus said it, it's true, all right? So, he will either hate the one and love the other, or he, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And then he makes it clear what he's talking about. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, this term mammon, like I said, I heard this, you know, being raised Southern Baptist, I heard about mammon, 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 mammon. And the whole thrust of the teaching that I heard growing up was, see, you can't have money. If you have money, money is evil. The Bible says money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. There's nothing wrong with Christians having money as long as the money doesn't have the Christian. And that's really what Jesus is talking about here. Mammon is a term that basically means money 
and things, and particularly in regard to it being a god to you. Now, he says you can't serve two masters, and you can't serve God and mammon. Now, I know a lot of Christians would just stand there and just unblinkingly look at me and say, well, Dr. Bill, I don't serve mammon. Really? <laughs> we, we're going to think about that a minute. You know, Keith Moore, when he was teaching along these lines, he said, uh, there's a whole lot of people serve that bass boat. Uh-oh. <laughs> he said, I don't see them in here in service on Sunday morning. Why? Because they're out on their bass boat. That bass boat cost them money, didn't it? It was a possession they acquired. It's something they enjoy. Well, there's nothing wrong with enjoying a bass boat, praise the Lord. My dad had a bad bass boat, and we loved it. We rode that thing all around the lake. I mean, it was a lot of fun. But Sunday morning must not be the only possible time that you're out there on that bass boat. Why is it that all day Saturday you didn't get on the boat? But Sunday morning, <laughs> you're there on the boat. Well, see, that speaks to something. That speaks to where your heart is. And that's really what we're talking about here when it comes to attitude is attitude of the heart. Where is your heart? What are you serving? And you might say, well, now, you know, I don't serve my bass boat. Really? You know, uh, when you went to get that thing, how much, how badly did you want it? Let's substitute bass boat. Let's, let's put car in there. Or, hmm, musical instrument. Uh-oh. <laughs> or computer. Oh. <laughs> now, we, now we're making it personal. <laughs> well, it's called a personal computer, you know. And I'll, I'll tell you a story about this computer. This particular computer is a MacBook Pro, 17-inch, 16-gig of memory. Awesome. And I wanted one pert and I own to a decade. You know, a whole decade, I kept... Now, you can ask Ben, you can ask Belinda. I talked about a MacBook Pro. Every time you turn around, it was I was talking about a MacBook Pro. And before too long, they were like, I'm tired of hearing about this MacBook Pro. <laughs> yeah, I got an amen. <laughs> and so, you know, what was it? Well, I just, I really wanted one. But you know, the doggone things are expensive. And I just couldn't bring myself to pay that kind of money for a computer because I was used to building my own and, you know, and, and getting it on the cheap and, you know, taking old stuff and making it new and refurbishing and upgrading. And I just couldn't see myself buying a MacBook Pro. And so for years, I, I confessed MacBook Pro. I thought MacBook Pro. I meditated on MacBook Pro. And finally, praise the Lord, I got one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you know, the funny thing is, it's a computer, it just, it runs, and it works, and, and it's all good. But it didn't make me a better person. It didn't improve me. Only God can do that. And this thing can't be my God. And you know, if, now, understand, I am not making this confession. But if it got run over by a truck which it won't because it's supernaturally protected. <laughs> but if it did, I'd go, well, hallelujah. It wouldn't really, you know what I'm saying? It wouldn't be the end of the world. And people treat things that way. If I don't have this thing, then that's the end of the world. If I don't have that car, then it's, my life is just a waste. That's the way it sounds. That's when you know you're serving mammon <laughs> because it's obviously got a greater position in your life than it should. And the thing about it is, God is not against you having a MacBook Pro. He's not against you having a bass boat. He's not against you having a car, whatever it might be, a house. But he's against that thing having you. He's against that thing being a God. God, and I'll tell you something about God here, and you know this from reading the Word of God. He is a jealous God. And there's nothing wrong with that. He's God. He gets the right to be a jealous God, all right? I mean, you know, some people say, well, that's not very nice. He's God. There's no one beyond him. He is the ultimate. So the fact 
that he thinks well of himself is fine. <laughs> He's God. And there shouldn't be anyone or anything higher than him in our lives. Amen? So we'll keep reading here. Therefore I say unto you, this is verse 25, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. That's your clothes, ladies. I know a lot of ladies go, oh, I've got to have that dress. Okay, if you want it, have it. But don't let it have you. So he says, don't take thought. Don't constantly be thinking about, I've got to have that piece of clothing, whatever it is. Or I've got to have this particular food or drink or whatever. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, in other words, he takes care of them. Are ye not much better than they? Now, I've said before, there's a lot of environmentalist wacko types that just hadn't got that vision that uh, people are more important than animals. Now, I love animals. Don't get me wrong. I have a kitty cat that I, I love that kitty cat. She's a sweetie, okay? But you know what? People are more important than my cat. And that's, that's a revelation to a lot of folks. I know they're probably going, oh, no. <laughs> no, the same thing is true of horses, dogs, cows, whatever. Uh, the polar bears that are, you know, swimming around because they can't walk on the ice anymore. Right. You know, all that crazy stuff that we hear about. The snail darters. You know, people are more important. And people get to use the resources of this planet because God gave us the resources of this planet to use for people. Now, again, that doesn't mean we're cruel to animals. That doesn't mean we go out of our way to, to you know, shoot them or whatever, you know, just for the fun of it or, you know. Again, if hunting is your thing, I'm not putting hunting down per se because hopefully you take those animals and, and use the resources, eat the meat, use the leather, whatever. Again, that's not my point. The point is people are more important. So that's what Jesus is saying here. I think this is something a lot of these environmental swacko types would be amazed to find out that people are more important than birds. But now Jesus' point is that if he takes care of the birds that well, then surely he'll take care of us. So really, we don't have to worry about the things we need, whether it's clothes or food or drink or cars or whatever. God will take care of that. But again, the attitude. That's the key thing we're looking at here is the attitude. We're not looking to the things. We're looking to God. And by seeking him first, the things come. And they come in such a way that it's not even really a big deal. We're not like... Oh, Lord, Lord, i got to have it, i got to have it, got to have it. That's the wrong attitude. That means you want the thing, see, more than seeking the Lord. So, again, attitude. So, let's keep reading here. Um, which of you, verse 27, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, uh, how they, uh, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven or into the fire, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? The folks he's talking to here that have the wrong attitude are not operating in faith the way they should. Can you see that? Because if they were, he wouldn't say, oh, ye of little faith. He'd say, oh, ye of great faith. No, these folks didn't have a lot of faith because they were looking to the thing to fulfill them. Now, Brother Keith said something as he was teaching along these lines that really struck me, and that was this. He was saying, you know, I have made a decision. Now, listen to this closely. I have made a decision to get a hold of my vocabulary and... This is just him personally now, and I agree with it. I've decided I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm no longer going to say I love my car. I love my house. I may say I enjoy it. I may say I like it. But I don't love it because love is not something that you should be involved in when it comes to things. Now, why do I say that? Because the Word of God tells us we are to love not the world. Matter of fact, hold your place at Matthew 6 and let's go to 1 John 2. 
1 John 2, 15. Love not the world. Now, he's not talking about not loving people and reaching them with the gospel. He's talking about the world and how it has effect on you. And that is clear from what he goes on to say in the next part of the verse. Neither love the things that are in the world. See, if we just love the car and love the house and love the thing that's in the world, our focus is wrong. And that's what we're talking about is watching our attitude. What is your attitude toward the things of the world? Here it says, if any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Oh, my goodness. Now, hold on a minute. I don't want anybody questioning my love of God, of the Father. Amen? And I'm sure you'd say the same thing. So I need to get serious about not loving the things that are in the world. Now, again, I can enjoy them. I can like them. I'm not saying hate your car, you know, obviously. I'm saying don't let it have you. Don't let it possess you. Don't love it. Just enjoy it. Nothing wrong with enjoying things. We'll find that out later in our, our study. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all, how much is all? All. All's all. <laughs> Big word. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, it is of the world. Now, how many times have we heard Pastor Ed talk about this very scripture with regard to these are the areas that Satan tries to pull you off in? And it's also what he used on Adam and Eve. Amen? With them, he tried to get them to look at the fruit that they weren't to have, lust after that fruit that they weren't supposed to have, and partake of that fruit that they weren't supposed to have. And he also tempted Jesus in these same three areas. It, 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 this, is his, this is his methodology. So this is what we need to look for and watch out for. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Those things are not of the Father, they are of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. And he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, these things that we enjoy, again, nothing wrong with enjoying them. We'll find that out in a bit. But nothing wrong with enjoying them, but they'll pass away. No matter what your thing is that you're enjoying, the sad truth is it's rusting, <laughs> it's corroding, it's getting old. Now, you may polish it and shine it and try to take care of it. And again, nothing wrong with that. But it's still degrading in quality. You know that with a car. You drive a car off the lot, brand new, you turn right around and drive it back on the lot, you won't get the same thing for it. You paid for it. Why? Because now it's a used car. It's a little crazy, but it's really true. I heard somebody say one time, I don't understand why my car isn't worth what I paid for it before, in other words, already, before I even make the first payment. <laughs> You know, it just doesn't seem right. But that's just the way it is. That car, simply driving it off of the lot, is already wearing. It's already becoming less, you know, uh, less new, if that, if that makes sense. It's degenerating to a certain extent. And here's the truth of this. There's a scientific term, you may have heard of this before, scientific term called entropy. Everything in the natural world tends to entropy. Entropy is that systems that are ordered tend to break down. Metal tends to rust. It's just the world, it's, I, I think personally, I don't have Bible on this, but just personally, I think this is a result of the fall and a result of sin entering into the world, and the curse entering into the world, and because of that, things that are new and fresh and clean and shiny get dull and rusted and old and start breaking down. Now you say, well, yeah, but Dr. Bill, you know, uh, the children of Israel left Egypt, and when they did, their shoes and their clothes didn't wear out that whole time. Well, that's supernatural, isn't it? 
That's supernatural divine protection. And you know what? You can believe for supernatural divine protection on your things as long as the things don't have you. Now, why do we know that? Because if you let the things have you, you're of little faith, your faith won't work, and the protection won't be there, okay? But if you just take the attitude, well, praise the Lord, the Lord blessed me with this car, this car is just going to run, not going to have any problems with it, it's a blessing of the Lord, well, he'll take care of it. Amen. You can believe for that. But the thing is, the whole time you're believing for that, where's your attention? On the Lord that blessed you with the car. On the Lord that's going to keep that car running well. Not on the car. The car is not the thing. You know, or put it this way, the car is the thing, therefore it's going to not matter, you know, in the long run. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go back up to Matthew 6. That was, we were getting a little ahead of ourselves there. Uh, wherefore, verse 30, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in heaven, shall not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith. Therefore, take no thought. Notice that. The way he phrases that, take no thought. Do you know a thought can be presented to you, but you don't have to take it? Yeah. Same thing's true of a, of a temptation. A temptation can be presented to you, but you don't have to take it. That's why it's a temptation, not a sin. Now, once you take the temptation and do the thing that the temptation's encouraging you to do, that's when it becomes sin, because you did it, you know, full will involved, you did it. But just the temptation, do you know that the Word of God says that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, because he didn't take the temptation up on what it was offering. So he was tempted, yet without sin. Do you know you can be tempted and not sin if you decide not to take the temptation and run with it? But now if you take the temptation and run with it, guess what? You can repent and ask God to forgive you and he will forgive you. But repent does mean turn, not do it again. Okay? Now I know there's people, let's face it, all of us, have something we deal with all the time. Just seems like we are constantly dealing with that thing and we are believing God to get a hold of it. You know, God understands that and he works with you on that. There's always a way. Whenever a temptation comes, he provides a means of escape. And if you find that means of escape, praise the Lord, you can take it and run with it, not have to be taken by the temptation. And that's what we ought to be doing. Too many Christians today, I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit here. Too many Christians today have bought into this greasy grace idea that, well, it doesn't matter what I do. And so I'll just do whatever I want to do. And they just go out and sin big time. Don't even have a thought about it. Now, i tell you the danger of that. There's a lot of dangers in that. But one of the big ones is your heart will begin to get calloused toward the fact that it's wrong. Now, you look at the world. Boy, I'm, I am getting off on a tangent, but this is a good tangent, so I'm going to run with it. <laughs> I had, did a message a few years ago called The Mystery of Lawlessness. And if you were not here for that message, this was years ago, I don't know, probably four years ago or more, um, you can go to our website, wfm.org, look at the uh, teaching archive, and go in there, and that message is in there. You can download the MP3 file, or you can play it right there on the website, whatever. But I'm telling you, every so often you teach something, and the Holy Ghost just completely takes over so strong that after I taught that message, I went back and listened to it and went, wow, that is good information. And it wasn't because I taught it because it was entirely the Holy Ghost, okay? That message is strong, and the reason it's strong, I believe, is because it is so important for us in this particular day that we're in right now. The mystery of lawlessness is at work. There is a spirit of lawlessness and that spirit and mystery of lawlessness is at work today more than I've ever seen it. We have politicians that are publicly standing up and brazenly saying, I will not obey this law, I will do this. And just boldly breaking the law, breaking the Constitution, breaking laws that have been enacted. 
And because of the mystery of lawlessness, now this is the point you need to get, because of the mystery of lawlessness, the world is stepping back and letting them get away with it. Because they are also lawless. Lawless means the law exists, but they do not obey the law consistently, repeatedly. They live in a state of breaking that law to the point that the whole world has gotten callous to that. Now you think about this. Right now we have a chief executive of the United States that stands there and says, I don't care what the lawmaking body of our country says, I have a pen and I have a phone and I'll do whatever I want to do. And he's supposed to be a constitutional scholar, so he must, if he truly is a constitutional scholar, which I might debate, but still, if he is, that means he is knowingly breaking the law going against the Constitution of the United States that he has sworn to uphold and does not bat an eye. Matter of fact, he, he happily uses his pen and his phone to do, to do anything he wants to do. Now, the question I have, could that have been something that we would have seen regularly, regularly, day after day after day on the news 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? I mean, if we had a president that would have done that, oh my goodness, the door would have had to hit him on the back end as he left because they'd have impeached him so fast. Today it's like, oh no, well, what are you going to do? The mystery of lawlessness is at work. The world is moving in a lawless direction. They're breaking the law regularly. Now, going back to my point that I was trying to make before I got on my soapbox <laughs> is that as an individual you can do the same thing with regard to sin. You keep operating in that sin, doing that sin, committing that sin. Oh, Lord, forgive me, committing that sin. Oh, Lord, forgive me, committing that sin. Over and over and over, there'll come a point that the, oh, Lord, forgive me, goes away. You're no longer seeking forgiveness. You're just doing the sin. It, you become calloused in your heart toward it. And then you start living in that sin. That my brother and sister, is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Because you will break fellowship with your father. He won't be able to talk to you about it clearly. Because you'll be callous to it. So we've got to watch that. So, going back to verse 31. Wherefore, therefore, take no thought saying. There's how you take a thought. You say it. Let's rhyme that back <laughs> and play it again. How do you take a thought? By saying it. That's the way everything works. It always works by words. So how do we take the thought? We say it. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now see, by saying those things, you're taking the thought, Oh Lord, I can't make my payments. I can't make my house payment. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And you're constantly talking it, and you and your wife are discussing it, and oh my, what are we going to do? You're taking the thought. You're saying it. It's becoming ingrained. It's becoming a real problem. All right. Uh, verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. Notice that he knows you have need of all these things. Not just a few here and there, he's going to sprinkle you with a couple of blessings and that's it. No, all of them. He knows you need them. He's not going to hold out on you. But here's the key, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his right standing, being in right standing with him, and all these things, how many? All these things will be added unto you. Now, that's your needs being met, house payment being met, car payment, whatever. All of it is available if you seek first the kingdom of God. Now, the reason I even get into all this is to talk about where our heart is and what our attitude is. If our attitude is the kingdom of God, if our heart's on the things of God, if we're looking to what we're doing, the most important thing we can do is that which advances the kingdom. The most important thing we can do in our life 
is that, you know, now I, I'm going to use this as an example, and, and please understand, you know my heart is very strong in uh, television outreach ministry. And the fact that we reach folks, think about the size of our church and the fact that we reach tens of thousands of people with our video messages. Praise God. That's just amazing to me. But here's the thing that, that, I, that I thought of as an example. There are several of you that come in here to run the cameras. And I'm sure a lot of days, a lot of Sundays, a lot of Wednesdays, you come in, you take the camera, you sit there, <laughs> run the camera, chase pastor around. It's a, it's a neat game. Chase the pastor <laughs> with the camera. And you don't think much about it, and you shut the camera down, you go home, or you go to lunch, or whatever it is you do after service, right? Don't think that much about it. But do you know that possibly, I don't know, but possibly that, one thing, that act of running that camera can be reaching so many people around the world, people you wouldn't have ever met, people you couldn't even necessarily have talked to, but that one thing that you're doing for the kingdom of God can be reaching so far out beyond what you can imagine right now. It is amazing. So, those, I don't know, hour or less that you're running that camera may not seem like a big deal in terms of time, effort, energy, thought, whatever, but it can make all the difference to that person out there that needs to hear the message and needs to see what's going on here at Faith and Victory Church. I tell you, we got the goods here. Hallelujah. And folks are seeing it. They may not be physically coming necessarily yet, although I'm sure they're bunch coming in, but at the same time, they're watching on video. So what you do for the kingdom is the most important thing in your life. That's just one thing. Sharing at the, you know, at the Safeway or <laughs> the Lowe's Foods or wherever you happen to be and talking to somebody in line about the Lord. Or that person at work that asks you, you know, what do you think about this? And you get into a Bible discussion with them. Happens to me a lot. And those few minutes, those are the critical things that are the key, most important. Not watching TV, not sitting around doing nothing, not reading a book, whatever, that might, you might think is fun. Now, again, nothing wrong with that. But where it counts is where the kingdom's involved. Where it counts is where we're reaching people with the Word of God. Hallelujah. And that's what's important. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And guess what? As you do that... A couple of things will happen when you seek first the kingdom of God by doing some of these things we're talking about, for instance. First of all, you'll start getting a joy. It's so fulfilling to, to do what God's called you to do. You'll get excited about reaching folks for the Lord. And that'll be joyful and that'll be exciting, but you're also seeking first the kingdom, so guess what? The things start coming. You'll start noticing, whoo, look at that, I got blessed. <laughs> I got that computer that I wasn't really expecting to be able to get, but I got it. Hallelujah. You know, things start happening. Because as you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, all these things shall be added, shall be added, shall be added. And it just starts coming in. Man, that's exciting. And it's not a thing of seeking the thing, because I tell you, that is a dead-end street. If all you're doing is seeking the, the thing... You're just going to get caught up in that, and your emotions and, and your life's going to get tied up in that, and you're not going to have the joy of the Lord by serving Him and seeking the kingdom. But if you do the kingdom stuff, all the fun stuff happens too. It's a neat system God's got for us. Amen. All right, take therefore no thought for the morrow, or tomorrow. Let's put it that way. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, Sufficient unto the days the evil thereof. Now, that may at first sound kind of negative. You know, it's like, well, man, every day has got its evil. <laughs> well, what he's really saying here, if you take the, the King James out of it a bit, he's basically saying every day there's things you're going to have to deal with. Every day you're going to have some issue to deal with or some uh, situation or bill or whatever it might be to deal with. You know what? Every day. Just don't even take thought about it. Just say, God's got it. God's handling it. I rolled the care of that all over on him. Praise the Lord. 
and don't, don't take the care. See, again, take the thought by saying it. Don't take the worry. Don't take the care. Don't take the concern. You have to take it. You can also say, I'm not going to take it. Just don't sign for it. You know, <laughs> If they try to deliver it, say, no, I don't sign for that. And go on with the, with the, with the Lord on this. All right, let's go back and, and uh, talk a little further about 1 John 2.15 where he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, for he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now that goes back to what we're saying about seeking the kingdom. If you're doing the will of the Lord, if you're doing the kingdom things, all the things take care of themselves. And you don't have to get involved in uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All the things take care of themselves. All right, let's go to, uh, this is just one verse out of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9, 23. Jeremiah 9, 23. And this goes back to something again that I heard uh, Pastor Keith Moore talk about that really struck me. It says, and, and I, I found this scripture after hearing him talk about it in a different light. So I found this scripture this afternoon while I was studying for this. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. Now, what's the word that keeps repeating? Glory. Don't <laughs> don't take glory in what you've been blessed with, whether that's riches and things that God's blessed you with, whether that is uh, intellect. You know, some folks mentally are sharper than others. Just the way it is. But don't let the person who has a great intellect take glory in that. You know, sit back and go, yeah, say amen. I'm a smart guy. You know, all that does is lift you up. In fact, the intelligence came from the Lord. Wisdom comes from God. Intelligence comes from Him. You might say, well, I'm not, I'm not the sharp, sharpest knife in the drawer, Dr. Bill. Well, no, you don't need to be confessing that. You need to be saying the love of God and the life of God, the Zoe life of God builds me up. You ever heard Brother Hagin talk about believing for the Zoe life of God to give him an intellect that was, that was second to none? The man could memorize Scripture. He could memorize information at an unbelievable level. And he'll, he would tell you, if you ask him about it, it's the Zoe life of God. He just kept believing for that and believing. I know that to be absolutely the case because in the natural, okay, in the natural, I'm not that good with mathematics. I have come to understand that through the years. But there was a point in my life back in the mid-80s when I was going to school in computer science. This was well after I graduated from college in 1978 and I had gone back to school in computer science and I had to take computer mathematics. That was learning to add, subtract, multiply, and divide in binary, octal, and hexadecimal. This was back in the days of punch cards, and you had to know how a computer worked at the gut level. Now, today, they don't even teach that. <laughs> this was back in the, in the early days when you really had to know how all this stuff worked. And I find that having learned that all those years ago, it's easier to do certain things now because I know the guts. I know how it works. But I went into that class, and I thought, oh, Lord. I mean, I, I, do, I do pretty well with 2 plus 2, but this stuff, my goodness, it's a whole different, you know, base. It's, it's not base 10, it's, it's base 2 and 6. And I'm like, what? It was a whole different way of thinking. And I heard Brother Hagin talk about the Zoe life of God. I heard him talk about the fact that he believed, he set his faith that he would have understanding, natural understanding. And so I said, Father, hallelujah, I am believing for supernatural understanding. I'm believing for the Zoe life of God. I started confessing that. I started believing that. Now get this. 
When I was in high school, <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit it, but I flunked algebra. I don't mean I did poorly. I flunked. <laughs> I had a 50-something, and I failed it. And because I was on college prep, I had to take it again. And I thought, oh, Lord, don't let me get the same teacher, but I did. Same boring teacher, Ms. Yokely, bless her heart. You know, yes, William, you need to do better. It's like she was a dried up little old lady and she couldn't have been that old. You know, when you're really young, you look at somebody that's like 50 and think, oh man, they're ancient. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm, but she wasn't really that old, but she just acted old and talked old. Oh my. And so I went through her class a second time, and I told her, I said, Ms. Yokely, please, I've got to pass this. She said, I know you do. You just hang in there, you do the work, and, and, and you'll pass. Well, I did the best I possibly could, and I came up that second year, and I had a 69, and 70 was passing. And she came to me. Now, back then, the reason I say William, back then they called me by my full name, you know. And she said, William. You did the very best you could, so I'm going to give you that point. So I got out of there with a D minus. And I rejoiced <laughs> that I was so blessed. So now that was just algebra, you know, A plus B equaling C. I mean, that was, that was it. So now here I am, about 1982, 3, somewhere in there, 5. I think it was 1985. I was taking this course, and it was computer math. Binary hexadecimal, oh my goodness. And I studied and I confessed and I believed. I got out of there with a solid A. 100 points. Now you, you got to understand, folks, that is a miracle of God. God parting the Red Sea was not a big deal <laughs> compared to me getting an A in computer mathematics. Oh my goodness. And to tell you the truth, the, that whole year of computer science that I took, I had a 4.0 average across the board every single class. And I thought, this is God. <laughs> now, at the same time, I had the interest, I had the motivation, I, was, I really enjoyed computers. So that was good too, but it had to be a miracle of God. So the thing is, intelligence, intellect, all of this comes from the Lord and you believe for it and you can receive it. So therefore, we don't glory in wisdom. We don't glory in might, strength. We don't glory in riches. But that doesn't mean you can't have the wisdom, that doesn't mean you can't have the strength, and that doesn't mean you can't have the riches. You just don't glory in it. See, it's an attitude. All right, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. He's talking to Christians here. I want you to re remember that he's talking to Christians. He says... Charge them. Now, charge is an interesting word in the Greek. It means more than just instruct them. Charge them means this must be law. Okay? This is strong. He's exhorting Timothy here as a young pastor to charge people that are rich in this world. Well, now, hold on. <laughs> We're word of faith, folk. We're supposed to be believing to be rich. Okay? Nothing wrong with that, as long as you go according to this charge. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Don't trust in it. Don't be high-minded. Well, I'm rich. I don't have to deal with what those peons have to deal with. See, high-minded. That's an attitude. Well, you can have the things and be rich and have a good attitude about it, and that's okay. But don't be high-minded, don't trust in the uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Underline that right there. That's what I was referring to earlier. He giveth us, believers, all things richly. So he's not holding back. Richly to do what? Enjoy. Nothing wrong with you enjoying the bass boat. Nothing wrong with you enjoying the car as long as your attitude's right. He gives you the things to enjoy that they, they who, the rich person that you're charging, 
that they do good, that they be rich in good works, that they be ready to distribute, that means give, that means when you get the finances, God wants you to give it away, not hold it. Because see, if you're holding it and hoarding it and not giving, then you're trusting in the riches, not in the Lord. He's the one who gave you the riches. Let them go. Now, I'm not saying be crazy. Use wisdom, yes. But when God speaks to you, you know, give 10000 to that person, say, fine, let me write the check. Give, be willing and ready to distribute. Willing to communicate. Again, this word communicate in the Greek is talking more about your behavior. Be ready to operate in the right behavior as a rich person. Lay, now, what happens when they do that? Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. In other words, there's heavenly blessing for you operating in the natural the way you should with your riches, your blessing. Now you may say, well, Dr. Villa, I'm not personally rich. You're blessed. I guarantee you, you're more blessed now than you were 10 years ago. I'm sorry, you are. You think about it. You meditate on it. You look at it. I know for a fact that where I'm at now is better than where I was 10 years ago. Absolutely. And that's the blessing of the Lord. And everybody, you look at your situation, I believe you'll say the same thing. So the thing is, the, the riches, the blessing is coming. Now, a lot of people say, well, I didn't have anybody give me a million bucks yesterday. No, maybe not. But it's, it's, it's incremental. It's blessing over time, remember? Again, situation, looking at me personally, I'm making a whole lot more now than I was 10 years ago. He said, well, yeah, you know, they increased because of inflation. No, you look at it, it's more than inflation. It's the blessing of the Lord coming in. And there's just a lot of other examples like that, and I'm sure there's plenty in your life that are the same way. But the point is, don't look to the riches, don't look to the blessing, look to the Lord that gave them, look to fulfill and, and do things for His kingdom, and be willing and ready to distribute. Be rich in good works, be willing to communicate. Laying up in story this good foundation and eternal life. All right, let's go to verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. <laughs> Plenty of those out there, particularly on Facebook. I think that's interesting. But anyway, <laughs> and oppositions of science falsely so called. I included, I could have stopped earlier, but I wanted to read this verse because I tell you what, there's a lot of stuff that's claiming to be science that's just not science. <laughs> It has nothing to do with real science. But it's science falsely so-called. And yet they're, they're attacking Christianity, they're attacking things of the Word of God because of science, and it's really not. See, I want to include that in there. Which some professing have erred concerning the faith, grace with, uh, be with thee, amen. Some professing have erred concerning the faith. Now, I mentioned Greasy Grace earlier. There's a lot of doctrines out there. People are erring or in error concerning faith, concerning grace, concerning all kinds of things that's going on in this world today. But praise the Lord, there's a lot of good stuff going on out there too. And we need to center up on that. We need to center up on the good things that God's doing. There's a revival coming, folks. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people... They'll woe and, and woe is me and groan and, and gripe and we're living in the Laodicean age. The whole church is just, you know, dried up and their, their love isn't for the Lord anymore and all this kind of stuff. You know what? That may be true at a certain point, a certain level, but that's not true of us. That's not true of Faith and Victory Church. That's not true of a whole lot of other churches out there. Keith Moore, I mentioned him, his church. Praise the Lord. Strong and going and blowing for the Lord. Hallelujah. There's a lot of churches out there that are doing well and that are preaching the Word of God correctly and seeking after the kingdom of God and the things of God. And we need to be centering up on that and not centering up on woe is us, all the bad stuff that's happening. You know what? It's the last days. There's some bad stuff going to happen. And there's things that are alarming that are happening. But I'm just going to concentrate on the Word and the kingdom, and seek that, and God's going to keep blessing me. And you know, we're going, we may be an island of blessing out there in all the sea of trash that's going on, but praise the Lord, we'll be there. 
and be an example and be uh, something that people can look to and say, whoo, hallelujah, they got it going on. Let's go over to Faith and Victory Church and see what they're teaching, praise the Lord. And that's, I believe that's happening. I believe people are getting a hold of some things, watching our TV broadcast, watching our... Uh, listening to our tapes and our, our audio that's going out there across the Internet and everything else. I'm just excited about what's happening. Praise the Lord. Well, did you get anything out of this tonight? Hallelujah. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.